Now, we've we've all been having a good time tonight, but you know who isn't having a good time? The fine people of Hollywood. No. I know, and I'm gutted just as much as you are, but it seems like they've hit hard times. Um, according, according to this article from Deadline, um, th there's a whole slew of these that have come out in the past week or so, but they say Hollywood contraction hits entertainment executive jobs. This is a full-scale depression. Uh, it says um, LinkedIn is usually used by professionals for networking with people for their field, posting updates when they get a job, etc., etc. These days, as one former industry type put it, it's become a kind of therapy site for unemployed entertainment executives who share their frustrations over the lack of opportunities in Hollywood and amid a major contraction. Um, I've seen lots of downturns, lots of job losses, but I've never seen anything like this, one veteran TV executive said. This is a full-scale depression for the entire entertainment industry. Um, over the past year, there have been waves of layoffs at Disney, Warner Brothers, Discovery, Paramount, NBC Universal, Amazon, Lionsgate, Netflix, Sony, and basically everyone else. Um, the layoffs that have affected not just the executives, but it's affecting the writers as well. Um, it says here, this is one, um, I'm scared why it's a brutal time to be a TV writer. The end of peak TV has ushered in an era of contraction with fewer buyers and fierce competition for the few shows that are staffing. Quote, people are in complete survival mode. Um, that, that Mike, is we, I'm not sure if it's the same article we covered on, on FNT on Friday, but th that one goes on basically to say that the end of peak TV translates as the CW doesn't exist anymore and it's not buying our shit. So everything's really bad. So effectively, the CW gets the credit for, for buying awful TV shows and putting lots of money into them and hiring lots of people. And now it well, no longer exists. There's lots of writers going unemployed because there's not enough people to buy their crap works. I don't think it's just the CW because it, it encompasses all the streaming services, uh, as they put here. It says the streamers like Netflix and um, uh, HBO max size their slates. The broadcast pipelines for um, all of them, Peacock, Hulu, Paramount Plus, um, Amazon are drying up. A decade ago, broadcasters collectively ordered 98 pilots per year. Today, that number can be counted on just one hand. Wow. So, I mean, that's the scale of the contraction that you're seeing here. Um, it's It sounds pretty horrific. Um, there was another one, actually, from Breitbart here. It says, um, unemployed Hollywood writers are resorting to bartending, DoorDash gigs as studios slash their spending. Um, but yeah, not I, lots of people do that, right? It's certainly like on the lower end of things. Um, you know, I was in London for uni and you know, I knew people who wanted to be, say, showrunners at theatres or they wanted to be writers on this, that or the other. Um, and you know, I worked in this escape room and had loads of people. Everyone in that escape room was working there because they needed to make some money because the temporary jobs they had and the fields they wanted to be in had ended at some point. So everyone, certainly at the lower end, has that experience. Uh, writers are not owed a job by the industry, certainly if they're not turning out things that anybody actually wants to watch. Um, that doesn't help. But... I find it slightly difficult to take that kind of thing very seriously when bartending is something that particularly early career professionals in notably transient jobs have to do all the time anyway. Like I've done it. Most of the people I know in that field have done it. Um, you I go into so. that job and career because you know it's a risk, right? And like risks sometimes do not pay off. Well, I think the difference here is that uh, you've got people who are at the level of showrunners who are experiencing mm. the same problems, which... It it shouldn't be like that, I suppose. Like you would imagine, when you get to the level of showrunner on, you know, even a mildly successful show, you've essentially secured a, a pretty stable employment, um, or particularly from an income point of view. And it seems like it isn't the case anymore. Uh, I mean, it says here. Hold on, let's see. Um, yes, <laughs> this is a quote here. Um, as a showrunner who is a queer woman of color can and I, I can't get work, that's saying a lot. It's very frustrating, one industry veteran told The Hollywood Reporter. I never thought I'd be a writer for as long as I have, but I didn't expect to run into a brick wall. I thought it would be slow tapering, but this feels like a complete cataclysm. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to forgive Hollywood for this. Um, another writer said, that's where a lot of us are. Almost everyone I know who had a deal, that deal doesn't exist anymore. 
yeah, the demise of peak TV has meant fewer opportunities for even seasoned Hollywood writers. Studios are taking an axe to their budgets as the industry is facing near catastrophic economic headwinds. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like you know locking down to avert a global pandemic followed by a very very expensive round of strikes in which everybody demands to be paid more might have some economic consequences for the people in the industry. Um, you could have sort of seen this coming if you were. Uh, not you know the kind of person who says that Hollywood owes me a job, which these a lot of these people seem to think they do. It's not easy for anybody in this position, obviously, but they're not the only ones in this position. Um, lots of people across the entire world in every sector of the economy are, are in similar positions, uh, and it's largely due to factors outside their control, and in some cases, it's factors that are within their control, like again, not turning in scripts that people actually want to watch for shows that people actually want to watch. But if you're going to make it much more cheaper and more profitable, for instance, for a streaming service to look to Japan or Korea for their drama content, not least because it's better received than most of the scripts they receive from Western content creators at the moment, then you're going to put yourself out of a job um, and you will have to end up working a bar. And then maybe once the economy recovers, you'll find your work experience gets you back into the industry again. But until then, it's it's not just you in that boat, and there's nothing particularly special about you, film writers, that demands you be kept in employment. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I And I guess it feels like they were allowed to exist within this golden age. Um, they were almost exist existing within a protected bubble where they could produce any kind of garbage that uh, they felt like, and it seemed like there was no financial penalties, there was no career re repercussions for it. We were subjected to just an absolute deluge of shit TV shows. I mean, like you only have to take a look at Disney Plus or, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like pretty much 90% of the content on Netflix to recognize that problem. And this is the bubble bursting now. And it's kind of necessary to see this kind of economic reality set in where, oh, you have been producing crap for the past five years or so. Nobody's watching your crap, but it costs tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to, to make. Uh, we need to reconfigure and find a way to make money again. And we are not going to move forward with you because you don't produce anything good. Yeah, I'm fine with that happening because it needed to happen. Yeah, this is the realistic correction that we've been wondering, when is it coming, right? At what point will there be intelligent decisions in who's getting what job versus it being tossed to you know whatever check box box based decision that was happening for a long time and then there was the you know golden time of tv shows for the last 10 years there were so many tv shows being greenlit netflix was just going full you know full pedal metal to the pedal and now I think all of that budget is drying up and advertising is drying up. And, and then a lot of the focus of, of audiences has, has also shifted because we've gotten so much rubbish for such a long time that audiences are really bored. They're tired. There's so many people who are turning to older catalogs versus the newer stuff. And then honestly, TikTok has really eaten into the concept of, of, of entertainment. Why sit and commit to a TV show that's going to be, you know, 20 hours versus for the next two hours, I'll just scroll through a, you know, a thousand videos. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, there was an interesting statistic for this recently where wasn't it like more than 50% of the content that's being watched on say Netflix or, or Amazon is um, older TV shows. It's stuff that's more than 10 years old because people are just reverting to like the older classics, I suppose. Um, partly out of nostalgia and partly because this stuff was probably just better written and is actually more entertaining than the garbage that they're being fed nowadays. I just think that's an interesting that's statistic, really, and it's probably only going to get worse as time passes. I think there's an element of the snake having eaten its own tail at this point, because for years we've said Hollywood has eaten its own tail because it keeps remaking these IPs and it keeps you know, just puking out the same crap again and again and eating it and puking it out again. And you've got all these remakes and requels and sequels and prequels. And at this point, it's like every IP is dead. The snake has eaten its own tail. There's no more tail left to eat. They've run mm. out of ideas. You look at the the release calendar for this year, it's just a bunch of remakes and requels and, and prequels and just garbage that people aren't interested in. And it's almost gotten to the point where the, the stuff that is the most successful, like you looked last year, 
you have Oppenheimer, Mario, and Barbie, and those are three franchises that people haven't really seen. Oppenheimer's not a franchise, but those are three new original ideas that people haven't really seen on a, new, on a big screen before, and they showed up in huge numbers. I think there's a huge thirst for fresh, original, creative ideas among audiences. People are just sick of seeing the same shit for the 400th time every time yeah. they go to the cinema or turn on a TV screen. It's like, I don't want the 84th fucking Marvel TV show. Just give me something new and original. I don't want to go see another Star Wars movie or another you know, superhero in, in Spandex Saves the World movie. Do something fresh and original. You've got to give newer generations their own their own sense of identity and in, in, in movies and in culture. And I don't mean I, I hate the, this expression they have that oh the audiences need to see themselves reflected on screen. Hollywood thinks that means they need to see their skin color on screen or are their genitals or whatever it is or their sexuality. <laughs> no, give, give them a sense of cultural identity. Like, what does it mean to be a 25 year old man or a 25 year old woman in 2024? Right? Mm. Put that on screen and people will show up. Yeah, it's funny. Absolutely. Like, I actually had someone, I had someone email me about this sort of thing recently where they're like, I'm 17 years old and I'm grown up in like the world that we have now. And I feel like I'm fucking lost because there's nothing for me to like attach to. There's nothing that I can say like, oh, this is unique to my culture, my generation. This is our thing. We don't have that. Like all I can do is refer back to old stuff and it makes me feel really depressed because it's like my generation's got nothing to call our own. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you're right. <laughs> you're exactly right. You don't have anything. Yeah, and that, that sucks. But like, I don't, I don't know what to tell people like that. Like, there isn't really anything now. I don't know. You, you've got like Twitch streamers, haven't you? And TikTok, you, Hassan Piker. He's he's one of your own, kind of. What about yeah. John Wick drinker? That's theirs. There you go. The, yeah, that really <laughs> defined a generation. Nice one. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, the, 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 there are many like changing trends. Some of it is just like this general economic downturn thing. Some of it is just a a fundamental shift in the way that that things are made and, and put to series. So, like, if you can compare the total number of uh, new shows piloted with a decade ago, and obviously things look really bleak, but you can compare the total number of new shows piloted versus the total number that are ordered straight into full series production, and that number's increased massively. So, like, what what you're seeing is fewer r small scale risks being taken on a smaller number of projects and many more projects just being said, right, yeah, we are going to immediately invest full scale in whatever you are producing for the full run of that series. So we're putting more money into fewer projects and we're banking on those things. And that's probably in part a reflection on the way that streaming services work and the fact that they are all very much dependent on these IPs they've been expensively buying up. So there are fewer chances for people to start creating things, but it's not that that there are no new things being made. It's just that we are taking longer term risks and what well, studios rather are taking longer term risks on them than they used to do. Cause it's not the same old, you know, network TV era when you had a, a commissioned pilot for a new sitcom every five minutes. Now it's no, we are going to have a, a Marvel show. It's going to star this character and we are definitely going to have a episode. So please just go straight ahead and make that for us, please. Thank you very much. Uh, fewer writers will get hired, but that's the way streaming services choose to operate. Eventually, that will either work or not, and if it doesn't work, then they'll shift to a different model, as they already seem to be doing. Well, contractually, don't they have to hire more writers now anyway? Because part of the terms of their strike resolution was like they have to have fifty-seven different writers for every yeah. show. You have to pay them more, and to... you have to hire a higher number of them at minimum, which is just asking for people on the lower end of the scale to be priced out, basically. So that again, fewer opportunities for people breaking in. And even there will be a net reduction in, in opportunities for people who are already in the industry, but they will get the pick of the jobs because who would you choose to hire if you have to pay them more and you have to have a certain number? People with established track records or people who amount to a risk. No one's going to be hiring young writers.